gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm back on my podcast with a very special guest, Mary Beth Looney. She is an independent scholar who is currently working in Rome, Italy, something of which I'm very jealous. So tell us a bit about your work, Mary Beth. About my work. So I'm an artist and an art historian. I have a foot in both worlds, which neither one of those worlds ever appreciates or understands. Um, the funny thing is, is that artists typically don't like art historians and art historians really typically don't like artists until they're dead. Um, so uh, I am a maker of uh, two-dimensional art, paintings, drawings, and then also uh, I've been taking up printmaking, intaglio printmaking while I've been here in Rome. Yeah, it was the thing I overlooked as an undergrad and finally making up for lost time. Uh, courtesy of Temple University in Rome. Uh, and uh, I also, as an art historian, am the author of a few games about art, his, art historical topics, uh, as well as um, a professor of art history for uh, students either online or here in Rome on a kind of adjunct basis. Awesome. So when it comes to games, what are some of the games that you have previously designed before we talk about your, your upcoming project? Okay. Um, so I have two games that are under the auspices of reacting to the past, which I know has already been addressed at least a little bit in your, your podcast series. Um, and so uh, the first one centers around art in the 1930s in the United States. Uh, and so it really focuses on the Works Progress Administration, courtesy of FDR, um, Communist Party, of the United States of America as well. Uh, um, and it has to do with these fundamental questions that artists were wrangling with at the time, which had to do with what is American art? Because up to that point, everybody had both eyes glued on what European modernists were doing. And so that figures pretty heavily in a lot of the content of the game. Um, but the players, the, the roles that are there in that game are some of the American artists that we actually have a fair amount of familiarity with, especially those from the 1950s, like Jackson Pollock, Willem de Kooning, Mark Rothko, all of these big bad boys of the abstract expressionist era who in the 1930s we're still trying to find their footing. Um, and so the game, in a way, kind of chronicles some of the paths that they took and their exposure to not only European modernists, but also Mexican muralists. Um, I don't have Diego Rivera in the game, but that's because he'd gotten in trouble for painting a mural that was unliked in 1934 in New York City. Um, but all of his compatriots that are well-known are, are in the game. Um, and the cool thing that I like about that game is uh, that I paired it with radio programming. So players have to put on a radio show um, so that uh, the, the, the glory days of radio, which was an important backdrop of the 1930s, if not a foregrounding issue, depending on who you are, um, that that... that that happens alongside all of this visual art. And it also encourages players to find ways to verbalize what they need to say about art forms that I think a lot of people struggle with how to talk about. Um, the other game, which I just unleashed, if you will, a couple of years ago, and that has to do with uh, an era slightly later, 1940s, uh, it's called Monte Cassino, and it has to do in part with the topic of really the point of our podcast today, uh, in the sense of it has to do with the destruction of a major monument. Uh, in the slightly early 1940s, the United States had already begun its progressive encroachment on the peninsula of Italy. It had already conquered Sicily and it was traveling up the boot towards Rome. And it hit a point, geographically speaking, where um, the, the, the fascists on the other side of the mountain range were waiting for them. And a major battle occurred on a hilltop, mon around a hilltop monument, um, or monastery, I should say, uh, at, at Monte Cassino. It is a repository of 
incredible numbers of original illuminated manuscripts. Um, it was founded by St. Benedict. Um, it is, it is, it is no great slouch in the history of, of monasteries or, or, um, we'll say cloistered communities of the Christian faith. Um, and the ultimate question of that game is, is a real one that occurred in history, which is the allies trying to determine if they can sex successfully defeat, um, Hitler and, and the, and the Italian fascists, um, without destroying this important monastery. Uh, and in fact, it was destroyed. That is commonly known historically speaking. Um, and so uh, the, the game largely involves personnel in the military. So almost all of the characters are, are actual characters. Um, and so you get a little tiny slice of what Italian life would have been like there, but it is mostly centered around the questions of, of course, the value of uh, cultural property, but also, and this was pointed out to me by somebody who works in, in let's say, cybersecurity, what is good intelligence? Because the, the bombing of Monte Cassino was in part based on misinformation. Um, mm. That was, yes. Uh, and so in the game, you have various role players stating what they think they know about the presence of the enemy inside that monastery. Um, and whether or not the invaluable art and books are still there and how many people are living there. And have we seen aerials on top of the building that suggests that the military on, on the opposite side has actually set up and, and set up shop inside. So all of these things are competing pieces of information. Um, and you can literally track historically speaking, you can go online and find these, um, these assertions made by various entities about what what was actually happening there what what was the truth um and the truth unfortunately was that there, there was no military occupation of the monastery um and so bombing it was really unnecessary um but you can even go on youtube and see what that bombing looked like it was incredible um the footage of that uh and the loss of life was you could say somewhat minimized except that people from the town of Casino had in some cases run to the monastery for shelter because they didn't know where else to be during all of this. It was a raging conflict. It went on for days. It was, it was muddy. It was wet. It was winter. Um, and so um, all of these, these poor people who had already dealt with enough were hiding out in the monastery because I, where else would they go? Um, and so there, there is loss of life, but uh, the art had been moved by Nazis uh, to Rome uh, weeks beforehand. So it is, it's, it's fun. It's, I think. Um, and I just had someone request uh, a copy of it to play test it, which I'm pretty excited about because I don't know, it may, maybe it's a niche subject for some people, but um, it relates to what we want to talk about today. Definitely. So before we get onto your current game, I just want to ask what inspired you to teach about and express these ideas about history and cultural property and, you know, art through games. Is that something that came naturally for you or where did, where did the idea come from? I wrote about this for um, an online resource. It's a community um, for art history, teaching resources. Um, and I think that as, a, as an art history instructor in Northeast Georgia uh, for a number of years, I wanted to use uh, the topic of an essay that I had read about as a graduate student myself called Bomb the Church, What We Don't Teach Our Students in Art 101. Um, and I had staged it as a debate with students in class. And um, without revealing the, the, the heart of the matter yet, I will just simply say that it became clear to me that in these debates, 
students very quickly made a judgment that seemed ill-considered or maybe not ill-considered. I should instead say very quickly considered um, and without perhaps pausing to consider the ramifications. Mm -hmm. I became acquainted with reacting to the past in 2010, um, thanks to getting to know somebody who was already in the community and they're suggesting that I go to a weekend workshop for faculty members. I went to one at the university of Georgia and played a game about, um, basically if, the title of the game is the Ides of March. Um, and so it, it's Rome 44 BC uh, and a uh, terrific, terrific game uh, concept. Of course, the game begins just after Julius Caesar has been assassinated. Uh, most of the players are senators. Um, and I was quickly enervated. I was just so excited about this idea of what this kind of role-playing game would do for my classroom that I very eagerly, eagerly wanted to employ it and did. Um, I cut my teeth on the Rome game and I used the Rome game a number of times as well as, as a few other select ones with students at my institution. At the time, there was only one game about art history at all. And yeah, um, at the time. It is now published um, and it deals with the topic of Impressionism in Paris. Uh, also a terrific game. Um, and at the time I thought that, you know, well, obviously there, there's potentially a route to publishing, but there is also, there's so many other topics in art history that we could construct games around, um, and perhaps bring art history to life or maybe just to more life, uh, than it already does. I mean, I, I think it's fortunate in art history, we always have something visual to look at while we're talking about these makers that are, that are uh, long lost in most cases, but um, uh, a regular straight up history doesn't necessarily have that. And instead they rely on art history to help sort of bring, bring history to a more visual sort of realization for people. Um, but I thought that the idea of, of students being able to inhabit um, artistic characters initially with my, American game in the 1930s. I, I thought that being asked to embody the persona of someone who has a certain drive or mandate would help fuel their understanding and if not empathy, then sympathy um, with various things, cultural forces, um, uh, influences, uh, needs, you know, a lot of the artists in the 1930s in America, of course, were on the bread line, um, uh, and trying to work for the WPA to at least feed themselves. Um, so th those kinds of things struck me as an important, important piece of it. Um, if I go back to the debate that I originally led with in terms of the, my answer to your question, I wanted students to have to think about more things than just simply the most immediate choice that they were making in terms of the debate. And I don't know about you, but you know, you ask a room full of students to debate a topic and sometimes you just hear crickets. Um, sometimes you have people who are just simply, you know, I, I, why do I care about this? Um, and the why do I care about this piece is hard to um, underscore, at least initially. My, my follow-up to the game that we're, we're talking about today uh, is a bit of a, a, a lecture about, okay, so if you all chose X, here's what your lives would be like if you, if you lived with that choice. Um, and that's when sometimes I see, you know, the light come on. Um, but uh, the role-playing aspect, I thought, would help this debate become more real and become more nuanced uh, than they were initially taking it on to start with. That's a great way to look at it, I think. And it's a perfect segue into talking about 
monumental consequence, which is your upcoming game. Um, that's not its original title. You can disclose if you wish, but, um, <laughs> but um, tell me what's, what inspired monumental consequence specifically as a game for you? That, that Albert Elson article was really the, the kickoff. Um, the author describes something that I don't know if he, he originated it. He simply says we at Stanford refer to this as the bomb the church problem. Um, and the problem is, the construct is, you live in a small town, probably a European one, where you have a major cathedral in the center. It is, it is the hallmark of the town. It is the thing that dominates, dominates the skyline. It has been there for centuries. It contains important works of art. It contains monuments or, or commemoratives to important people of the town. Um, and an invading army has set up camp inside that cathedral. And so it is up to you as members of the town to determine what, what your choices should be. Do you send in fellow townspeople to sneak into the church and attempt to roust out the enemy? thereby risking their lives? Or do you just simply bomb the church? And that is, that is the conceit right there. That is all there is to it. Um, uh, and so I would present that to my students in, in class, as I said, and it, ultimately the overwhelming answer was, well, we would have to bomb the church. It doesn't mean anything. It, it, in fact, is, you know, it, it's a materialistic object, some people would argue, or it was um, something that you could certainly replace. Um, and so that, that's something I would have to force people, I have to sort of like tease it out of them a little bit to say, you know, what, what, what do you do with your church if it's not there anymore? Um, to turn it into a game meant that I could invest the, the, the conceit with um, various players and various ambitions. And so you have members of a civic militia, you have uh, townspeople, widowed mothers, um, you have the sons of those widowed mothers who might be conscripted into said militia. Um, but you also have the church sexton, i.e. the facilities guy or, or girl. Um, you have uh, the priest, the town doctor, and I, I wrote an expansion pack so that uh, we could get even, you know, for people with big class rosters, um, you could have um, the prioress and a young nun who wants to, you know, she's, she's looking for love and all the wrong places. And um, so you, you can have, you can have these kinds of like mini dramas, um, but you also have the town apothecary um, and an, a number of other individuals. Everybody's got a stake in the game. Uh, and the bottom line is that you're presented with this, this scenario, and then you must convince each other which way to go, bomb the church or send in the militia. Um, and that is, that is the basic description of it. What else can I tell you about it? So I'm assuming that you've been playtesting it. So you said that when you do this as a debate, you tend to just kind of get an automatic knee jerk. Well, obviously we will just destroy the property and preserve human life. Uh, do you find that having people play the game adjusts the results to an extent? It adjusts the results because of the construct of the game in the sense that it is not a one shot hit where you say, okay, everybody, you know, cast your vote. Um, there are, there are limitations set up within the, within the game so that um, if you don't have a 75% uh, agreement on one side, then you have to go back in and uh, do more convincing of each other. And uh, so certain players are advised not to vote um, and others are encouraged to be, to sort of like feel this out a little bit and, and see what other people have to say. And so the argument for either bombing or not bombing the church unfolds, if you will. Um, and so people start to dig out some of those nuances um, that are either in their role descriptions or are things that they have perhaps thought of on, the, on their own. Um, and so I have been struck by the fact that in play tests, and this, this game has been 
play tested in play test mode, if you will, for the last, I think four to five years. No, I apologize longer about six years. I wrote it before moving to Rome. Um, it is on the reacting to the past game library site, which you have access to if you become a member of reacting to the past, um, for a nice small fee of say you're an independent person like me and you don't have a school to help reimburse you for that membership. Um, uh, I am told by site administrators that it is the most downloaded micro game of all the ones they have. And they don't have a huge number, to be fair. Some of the micro games they have, and we classify these things as micro games because they are playable within one class session. Um, some of them are precursors to a longer game in reacting to the past series um, that sort of set you up for more content acquisition. Um, and, you know, it, it, micro games have a variety of purposes, but in, in my particular case, what I learned is a, I can always be surprised by people who report in the, uh, the faculty lounge on Facebook for reacting to the past, uh, community members. They themselves as game masters are often surprised by the outcome sometimes, um, of, uh, people deciding that they're not going to bomb the church. I have never kept tabs on how many have been for or against in the end, um, because I, I don't, in the end, I think that we, you've got far too many kinds of groups using this game, not just student groups, but um, a lot of people have used this as a way of debuting, reacting to the past to a group of faculty that they're trying to sort of sell the idea to. Um, and so you, you, you've got a wide range of intellects. You've got a wide range of people with cultural values um, and, in operation there. And so I don't, I don't really know. Um, but I am, I'm, I'm, I'm soothed really by the fact that uh, it turns out that you can, you can get the kind of outcome that ultimately suggests that, that, there, that we do understand the value of cultural property. That actually leads into, I, I guess, me declaring my own bias and also into the next question. So I wanted you on here really badly because arguments about cultural property have actually been a major part of my life. Uh, my big job in college was photographing tablets for the Persepolis Fortification Tablet Collection. Uh, so when I was an undergrad, I took wow. pictures of Elamite tablets for a professor. Okay. And the project was forever in doubt because technically the Persepolis fortification tablets are the property of Iran. And they were the subject of a lawsuit from families who had lost family members in a terrorist attack and who wanted mm -hmm. some sort of compensation from Iran. And the only thing they could think of to like get assets from them was the Persepolis fortif fortification collection. And so there were years of court cases before eventually it was decided that cultural property is not something that you seize and you put up for auction but that was a live question. And also, you know, I was in Syria in 2010 ah. before the Arab Spring. So many of the things that I saw are no longer to be seen. Yeah. And I get pretty emotional about it. So like for me, you know, I'm a historian. I love ancient things like cultural property. Like I really believe in preserving the things that we have. I do often feel that certain historical artifacts or collections are worth more than my life personally. Um, is that something that you hoped people would at least think about? I mean, I know that we always do things for a reason. Uh, I know that you have to leave players in a game, right? Free to make a choice, but is there a choice that you hope for from the game? The choice that I hope for is for at least people to be impressed with how much art actually impacts their lives on a daily basis. <clears throat> I, I live, I live two blocks from the Pantheon. Um, so I walk past the Pantheon pretty frequently and I try to remind myself that when I turn the corner and there it is in all of its monumentality that I, it, that it never becomes this backdrop for me. 
that is just part of living in this in this neighborhood and oh the sea of tourists in front of the piazza i've got to swim through this 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 steep current um i i instead want to always try to look upon that as freshly as possible and remember um it's it's import for all of the art historical reasons that i could i could name um but but also how much that that temple shape and construct then impacts so many others, including the one that everybody wanted to argue about whether or not it was truly breached by patriots or otherwise on January 6th. Um, I'm not sure if people really think that consciously about how many members of Congress said people were trying to destroy our temple of democracy. Um, these things are real symbols and I'm not, I, I, I'm, I don't kid myself. Um, I know that, uh, that, that symbol is not the thing that if it went down, if it went down tomorrow, then so too would democracy. That's, that's absurd. Um, but I do think that it is, there's, there are a, a series of running threads for us artistically, visually speaking, um, that are are deeply, deeply embedded in our consciousness. And I think to disrupt that uh, fundamentally disrupts us and our, our continuity with the past. Um, so I, at the, at, when, I, when I stage this, this construct as a debate, and even when I now stage the game, um, it doesn't matter how it goes, what the outcome is. I ultimately say those of you who were on the bomb the church side, I want you to think about how your life would be if you followed through with this, this precept. If you are willing to bomb the church, you are willing to live without art. So I want you to think about how many different ways art is in your life on a daily basis. Get rid of your radio, your television, your streaming. Um, get rid of those pretty colors of your bathroom towels and your, your really awesome funky shower curtain. Um, your, clo your, your closet is full of nothing but, I don't know, name a monochrome, white, gray, black. That's it. And it's all the same. There is no differentiation. I mean, I enumerate all of these different things where somebody with some kind of creative uh, outlook had an imprint on your existence. Uh, and I've had people actually get all teary eyed in front of me when I start to like really drive home this idea that without it, you know, this is your life. So um, I, I, I feel like I have to do it in a contemporary uh, kind of framework um, because in part American students in particular, unless they come to Europe, or some other place where you get to see things that are of this considerable age, um, it is hard to connect with the value of old, old things because the United States is such a young country. So when you meet someone who like, I mean, there, there are plenty of people who are just kind of not into art. Uh, what would you tell someone who's kind of fresh to art appreciation? Um, how would they get started? What would you tell them to look for to begin to nurture an appreciation for what's around them? Well, um, uh, it, it, first of all, I think what we have to do is destigmatize this idea that it's only for elite people. Um, and so we have to talk about uh, what do you, what do you have on your walls at home? Um, what, what are your color choices? I used to do this with art appreciation students and, and learned and, and crazy things that I didn't expect to see coming. Like the person who only preferred all of her interior, um, decor, like a bedspread, couch cover, cushions, wall colors, everything just needed to be black and white and gray. That was what she was satisfied with. But she loved reproductions of Van Gogh paintings to be framed and hung on her walls. And so, you know, in the, in the end, I was like, okay, so what we're saying here is that Van Gogh does for you what you would rather just not do for yourself, but let someone else do, um, which is bring in you know, this riotous amount of color. 
Um, and also, uh, I also had a student who uh, brought in examples of her collection of work by serial killers that she um, that she collected. It's completely fascinating. Um, uh, but so the, the point is, is okay. What 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 do you like, and why do you like it? I think is the first first step that you have to take um, because we do make conscious choices almost all of us. Um, and there, there's something that drives that. And from that point, you can then talk about the language that we actually commonly use when we talk about art, uh, the elements and principles of design, and that how those things are manipulated by whatever kind of artist you're talking about to help yield some kind of an outcome. Uh, and then we, we take it from there. We talk about art types and, and and then we eventually dive into history. No, so I actually wanted to pick up on something that you said at the beginning of that comment, which is that you want to make art less elitist and you want to make it that's something more for everyone. And that's something that I actually also struggle with as a Latin teacher. A lot of people perceive Latin as sort of an elitist, useless thing that I think is quite enriching for your life, but it's it's a it's there's a lot of art of convincing. So <laughs> how do you give people a sense of ownership over something that is ancient and that maybe feels elite and like not something that's of them and not something that's theirs. That is a challenge that we are going to, I think, perennially struggle with. You immediately make me think of um, the fact that when we invaded Baghdad under, under G.W. Bush, um, or I should say under Bush. When we invaded Baghdad, um, I have to say the most riveting, one of the most riveting presentations I ever saw at the College Art Association Conference and in my history of attending those, those uh, conferences was a presentation actually written by, but not delivered by, the former director of the Museum of Baghdad. Um, Donnie George was his name. Uh, he was too ill to make the presentation, and so I want to say he had a family member deliver it. But it was it wasn't a speech. It was simply a recollection of what what that was like, of knowing that U.S. military had already set up in Baghdad, um, but that conversations with certain individuals in uniform at various points in the city yielded this unfortunate fear um, that they did not even understand that they needed to be barricading and protecting that museum. And as you know, it was uh, broken into and looted. Um, and it was such a moving uh, story. And it led me to think about how, you know, what, what do United States military members, what, what do they learn about the places that they wind up being in? Um, and, uh, I can send you information. I'm sorry. I don't have it on me at the moment, but I have been in contact with somebody who, um, actually, uh, is, is an employee of the federal government who helped drive this, uh, making a playing card decks that have photographs of major works of art in the Middle East and other, other, yeah, other, are other far flung places. So what do you do when you're not flying your planes, uh, in the air force, you, you hang around and maybe you play cards with your buddy. And so on the backs of those cards are ways to sort of get military members to connect with it. So, so I, and I, I don't approach this exclusively from the standpoint of whether or not to, to outrightly damage or leave something unprotected so much as I think that, the other piece of Donnie George's story that that you made me just think of was the fact that looters were not the only people who who broke into the Baghdad Museum. There were also just regular citizens who went in, found something that had been liberated from their glass case or, or whatever, and they took it, took it home, and waited. And they waited weeks. And then when things finally calmed down, they came back to the museum with those objects to say, we, we, we were afraid that this object would, would 
go away into the black market and we would never see it again. And so we just held on to it and we're really sorry, but we thought we, this is the only option that we, we really could think of. And so there was this, this effort to save art, but embroiled in Donnie George's presentation was this running theme of how do you encourage, I mean, because these are Baghdad residents looting the museum for good or for not. Um, but they, they're, they were disassociated from those objects. They did not see them as anything other than other examples of the ways in which they were disenfranchised somehow in their own, in their own society. The museum was the thing that, that wealthy elite, you know, smart people go to, not the, the working guy who sells, you know, his wares on the street. Um, and so how do you, how do you get that kind of connectivity? How do you get that sense of ownership is a super steep struggle, I think. Um, I, I have to say, when I went to the National Gallery of Art um, years and years ago uh, to go, I, I was just on a vacation trip to Washington, D.C., and I was walking around the mu museum with my Canon AE-1 uh, analog camera around my neck, and a security guard walked up to me, and he said very sternly, looking down at me, and he said, what kind of film do you have in your camera? And I said, well, I have 200 speed film, 35 millimeter, but my lens cap is on my camera. So please don't think that I'm just taking photos randomly because I had in my head the usual rule, which is no photography, which museums have largely uh, been doing away with lately, uh, much to my happy surprise. But at the time I thought I, thought I was gonna maybe be in trouble. And instead he said to me, a smile broke out on his face and he said, well, why aren't you taking pictures? And I said, well, I didn't think I was supposed to. And he was like, this stuff is yours. You own it. And I never thought of it that way. So, I mean, on, you know, I guess what I'm saying is, is on a massive level, how do we, how do we connect people to, to the objects that are part of their cultural heritage on a one-to-one -one level, how do we encourage people to have a connection with objects of their cultural heritage? Those interactions are capable in a variety of ways. And I think that bottom line is, if we all share some of that vision, it can happen more frequently. I don't think we can institutionalize this. Um, I don't think that we can take people from the slums of a city to the fancy museum and necessarily drive home that idea that it belongs, that what's in there belongs to them. Um, I, I don't, I don't think that that is that there is no easy answer, except that if we all share this vision that these things have some importance, we can have the one-to-one -one or the group or somewhere in between uh, kind of success. So this discussion of how to, create appreciation for artifacts of your own culture and create a connection with your own past is I think one aspect of the discussion. But I also wonder, you know, for something like bomb the church, um, can you also use it to help create appreciation for other people's art, for art that's from other cultures that maybe you don't feel a personal connection with? One thing I thought was really interesting is that, you know, we, we have talked about monumental consequence as something that maybe is assumed to be in Europe. What if it's somewhere else? Um, do you think that you would get different results from your playtesters? And also, how could you change that? If it's, you know, if you have a lack of sensitivity towards art from somewhere else. I, I have thought about that simply because in playtests, particularly with um, faculty members from a wide variety of institutions and backgrounds, they have said, um, sometimes derisively and sometimes uh, from a more open-minded point of view, that, you know, my students at my school, wherever that happens to be. Um, they are predominantly whatever faith um, or, or they are high income, low income, you know, all of those kinds of demographics um, play a role in informing how people will respond and whether, whether or not they will embrace that kind of topic. And so at one point I remember doing a play test and all of the feedback I was getting from the participants, again, faculty, academicians, uh, was it, well, 
well, what if you did an expansion pack where it was um, a mosque? Or what if you did an expansion pack where it was, I don't know, something that wasn't religious at all, like a library that was important? And, you know, I, I, at the time I said, I don't know why you can't just adapt this to your own needs. Um, and it, it wasn't so much that I, I didn't want to do that kind of work. It was that I couldn't see an end to it. If you, if you create, uh, you know, one kind of option or five kinds, then you will have five more pop up and go, yes, but what about our special interest? Um, I think that in the end, the, to, to borrow uh, to borrow drug terminology <laughs> getting in touch with the object that is that is of cultural importance to you and your heritage may be the gateway to then being able to translate that to another an, another culture another another place in the world and and I I am saying that because of what was clearly this interest is that everybody seemed to agree that we should care about cultural property in some capacity. But if you made it religious, then that might, you know, that might ostracize some people. And especially if it's one kind of religion or there, there was, there was an agreement on one level and then everything else became much more individualized and specialized, but that the running theme was if you make it something they can connect with, then you will see greater investment. So do you have a hope that people will take your game and adapt it and recast it and just make it however they want? Is that your intention as a designer? Um, it, it was never my necessarily, it was never my intention. It strikes me though as a realistic outcome. Um, and this is something that I, I find is interesting among academicians. You are either the kind of person who will take that core idea, principle, pedagogy, whatever it is, and simply manipulate it to your needs, or you will be the person who sees that same thing uh, and think, well, that just isn't going to work for me. Um, you, you, you either want to take the chance and do the work and 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 make it yours and make it good by making it yours. Um, or you just find it not applicable and you're going to move forward and do something else or do what you always do. I, I don't know. Um, so uh, I will say that the design of monumental consequence right now has very much a Eurocentric aesthetically speaking, a Eurocentric kind of feel. Um, I've just been shown um, a mock-up for the cards that will be the roll, the roll cards for players um, that the the fine fine folks at Central Michigan are uh, designing, and there's there's still there's very much a kind of gothic cathedralish kind of, of feeling to it. Um, I, I I don't know I don't know how to encourage anyone and everyone to be willing to say. Okay, I like this idea. It's not exactly what I, I had in mind, but I'll just adapt it. Because I feel like in my world, I have to adapt a lot of things. I mean, I use, obviously I used a, a drug analogy a minute ago, but I also use food analogies a lot when I talk about art and art history. We're going to talk about Roman concrete. Then I, I you know, and the, and the Roman concrete ingredients for the, the dome of the Pantheon. It changes as you go from the base all the way up to the top. What they use in the way of particulates changes in order to help with that weight distribution. So I talk about Rice Krispies and Rice Krispie treats. You know, I mean, it, it just, to me, that's, that's an easy leap. And most people go, oh yeah, okay, right. Um, and then they start thinking about Rice Krispie treats. Um, but other people, uh, are just, they, they're just not built that way. I had a faculty member, a very sweet colleague say to me once, you know, when it came to using reacting to the past games in my classroom and then also designing and just using games, uh, that I'd heard about or thought I might tweak a little bit and, and, and use on my own. She's like, well, some of us just don't have that same kind of confidence. And I never really thought of it as confidence. I, I suppose you, you can, 
I mean, you could fall flat on your face um, uh, by adapting something and it not going well. But I also argue that if you tell the people that you're doing this experiment with on a given day, that this is an experiment, let's see if we can break this thing. Let's see if it actually could work. You get that conspiratorial sort of spirit happening in the room and people tend to be all in. Uh, you've trusting me with the idea that maybe we can, we, oh, okay. Um, and so maybe you do fall flat on your face. In the end, you've all reached a collective agreement. You've probably learned some stuff. Uh, and uh, it, it's all good. Awesome. So you are having this game, Monumental Consequence, published through CMU's Academic Press. Do you have any comments on how that experience has been since this is sort of a new thing, like this academic games press? <clears throat> this is uh, this is new. Uh, I think it's new for everybody, including them. Um, Jonathan Truitt has been extraordinarily supportive. Um, he was really partly the inspiration for my creating this game in the first place because he debuted his game, uh, which included some of the same mechanics um, at, a, at a game development conference that I had attended a few years prior. And so I've known him a long time, um, but I only see him, you know, maybe once a year, maybe, maybe once every two years. So, I mean, that's how our friendships work, I guess, in a lot of ways um, in, in, in today's world. Um, he has an assistant, Andrew Devaney, who um, has been working with me on the design of the package. And um, I have appreciated every step of this experience so far because if they are talking with other game developing companies, and sometimes they are, um, I get the fully honest rundown of why bomb the church as a title was a, was, was not desirable, for instance, and the support and encouragement to, to, uh, to pursue changing the title, but still being given permission to, if I really like had to hold on to it, that, that we would, we would try that anyway. Um, so, uh, they've been supportive. They've represented me well in, in the few instances where they've needed to so far, and uh, it's a it's a long process, but I expected it to be. Uh, we're feeling our way, and and I'm okay with that. Fantastic. And then I have one more question for you. This is either the easiest or the hardest question of the whole interview, I guess. Um, so you are very concerned with the preservation of cultural property for us for future generations. What is the piece of art or the monument that you personally think would be the the greatest loss? What would break your heart the most? Oh, wow. What would break my heart the most? Okay. It, this may not be the answer I would give you in, in two months. I don't know. But, um, it, it, well, so I talked a lot about the Pantheon, and in some ways it's been kind of a touchstone because it was the, we, we learned about where we were going to live before we moved here, even though the, the embassy, the U.S. Embassy assigned this apartment to us. Um, and so I spent a lot of time looking at Google Maps, so, you know, going, wow, look where we are. Um, and being all starry-eyed about the, um, the things that we were close to and that I would get to see on a daily basis. But there is a church in the neighborhood of Trastevere, the medieval church of Santa Maria in Trastevere. It is arguably the first church dedicated to Mary in Rome. Santa Maria Maggiore is the other church that people, of course, tend to think of and many feel strongly about being the first church dedicated to Mary. Nobody's ever going to settle that argument, I don't think. Um, but that church is... It is at once on a grand scale, maybe not like St. Peter's grand scale, but still pretty good sized basilica that is still very intimate in some way for me. Um, and so there is a, a, an emotional quality to being in that space. Um, some people, of course, I think would argue that it's um, very spiritual in the sense that it is dedicated to Mary and the Mosaic and the apse, which dates to, I want to say, the um, 10th or 11th century, 
um, is unique in the sense that Mary is being crowned the queen of heaven um, in, in this mosaic. Uh, and she has this super familial kind of pose with Christ in, in that portrayal. They both sit on the same throne together. Um, but that church is also a palimpsest of Rome. Its beginnings date to maybe the fourth century with the miraculous fountain of oil that, that came out of the ground in the location. Um, the, the, the church's floor dates from one era. The columns, some of them come from the baths of Caracalla. Um, the, there, there is almost every century that you can get your hands on in this, in this city is somehow represented in that church. And um, they say Rome is, it's a lasagna. It's a layer cake of, of all of these, different, um, of these different eras. And that church in particular is, it's, it's a neighborhood place. The piazza in front where kids are playing soccer and people are having drinks and talking. Um, the, the university students who, who uh, occupy the neighborhood are very much, um, they're part and parcel of the fabric of that place. Uh, they're present. And then you have, you know, all the pilgrims who are coming to this remarkable church um, that uh, is so remarkable because in some ways it has this unremarkable um, kind of, of placement. It is, it is not the pantheon of Roman temples. It is not the, the Christian church of all Christian churches. It is just special and its accumulation of those layers you could never repeat that you could never repeat that and that i think is what makes it um, so remarkable and it would impact me emotionally if it were lost i like it i like it a lot so where can we find you online you can find me at www.marybethlooney.com all one word there um, and you can also find my essay just by Googling my name. You can find my essay in art history teaching resources about the church or about, sorry, about bomb the church, um, as its original, uh, game title, uh, name. And yeah, that's it. Fantastic. And everyone, I can be found anywhere, as you know, as Beyond Solitaire. Uh, thank you all so much for listening to this podcast. And especially thank you, Mary Beth, for coming on. It's been so wonderful to talk to you. It's been a blast. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, and happy gaming.